Uh, yes, apathy, indifference, and just a lackadaisical attitude. We all know what those things mean. But what is it? It's a wakefulness. It's, it's being like I am in the morning hours, not like I am after 9 o'clock at night. I'm anything but wakeful when it gets anywhere near what should be a normal person's bedtime. Uh, you know, that's just it. And that needs to, that's the opposite of what I need to be. I need to be awake. I need to have vigilance is another word that would describe it. It's being on guard. It's being on alert, on alert to something or against something coming or happening. Um, <clears throat> and so this morning, I just want to remind you of a few things that a few things that we need to watch over, okay? So some things that we need to watch against or over. And the first one that came to my mind that I need to be vigilant concerning is the idea of our thoughts, our thoughts. We need to have control of our mind. In Proverbs 23 and verse 7, it says this, For as he thinks within himself, so he is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Okay? Um, and then in the New Testament, much is said about our minds. My, my thoughts, when I think of the mind, go right to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 where it says, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit have their minds set on, in other words, on the things of the Spirit. Okay, so where your mind goes is where you go, eventually. In the book of uh, Galatians, we find out what those things are that we want to keep our minds off from. We need to watch out for thinking about these kinds of things. In uh, Galatians 5.19, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Those are the things that God does not want us to have our minds dwelling on those things. Uh, as Christians, we should never spend time thinking about things we would never dream of doing because many times, if we allow our minds to indulge that type of thinking, eventually our actions will follow. And how we need to watch over our minds, our thought. Uh, I go over just a couple pages to Romans chapter 12, and I think we see the answer to being able to live a life with thought that are where God wants them. In uh, chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We'll stop there. Transformed. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by how? The renewing of your mind. And so, first of all, Paul here is really is yelling a very loud stop doing what you've already started doing, which is sad. 
but it was true. Uh, they had already started taking on the appearance of the world. Paul's saying, stop doing that. The word conformed means to masquerade, to represent on the outside what you are, what doesn't represent what you are on the inside. Okay, so it's, it's used uh, as the devil masquerading as an angel of light. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to let show on the outside what's really on the inside. Dan talked about, um, maybe that was in Sunday school, but he talked about his uh, grandchild finding a, um, a, a what? Caterpillar, that's right. Found a caterpillar, they took it home, put it in a jar, fed it, and pretty soon it was a chrysalis and became a butterfly. That's the other word we're talking about here. That's what's supposed to happen to us once you become a Christian. You're supposed to start having your mind be transformed. And that's the word we get metamorphosis from, is this word right here. Um, and transformed, what's supposed to be transformed? Our thinking, our thought patterns, okay? And <clears throat> so, how does this renewing of your mind take place, though? Think about it. How does that take place? Uh, it only takes place if God transforms your mind. We can't just say, okay, I'm going to have a transformed mind now. God has to do it from the inside, doesn't he? We know that. Um, but uh, how does he do it? Only as the Holy Spirit takes the word of God uh, and, and only through consistent study and meditation can the Holy Spirit. If you don't get in the Word, and you don't study, and you don't meditate on the Word, can, always oh, say God can do it, can he? Can God, uh, uh, can he make us holy without our participation? If you don't ever get in the Word, can He use the Word in our lives to transform our lives? Hey, sanctification is a joint effort. You have to do your part. If you don't put yourself in the way of Christ, as some famous guy said one time, you have to put yourself in the way of Christ. You do that when you come to church. You do that when you go to Bible study. You do that anytime you come before Christ in the scriptures, right? And so it's only through study and meditation that our minds can be saturated and controlled by the Word of God. I believe if you're in the Word, God is going to use the Word to transform your mind. And we have to believe that. So that at some point, we can actually say with Paul, that we have taken every thought into captivity to Christ, right? In Second um, Corinthians ten five, and so uh, boy, it, it all starts up here, doesn't it? We've got to have control of what we're putting into this thing up here, right? And I don't think it works to just try to take something out. I think you have to force it out by putting other things in, right? How do you get the air out of a bottle? You fill it with water, right? And it's the same thing. It's replacement. Replace all the clutter and nastiness that can occupy our minds with the Word of God. So let's control our thoughts. Let's be on guard, is what we're saying today. Let's be on guard over what we think about. Another thing that uh, hit me was the how we need to have control or how we need to watch over our affections, our affections. And while the first point talked about our minds, this point talks about our hearts. We better watch out what we get too attached to in this world. We better be careful. 
we better be on guard. Because Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Okay? Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart. That's what we're talking about today. You know, there is a love that God hates. I preached a sermon one time, the love that God hates on 1 John 2, 15 through 17. There's a, there's a love that God loves, of course. Loving Jesus, loving one another in the body. God loves that love. But there's a love that he hates. Because James chapter 4 and verse 4 You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't know about you, but that sounds kind of scary. And uh, who wants to be considered an enemy of God? And yet, if our minds and our if our hearts are attached to to this world, and mainly I'm talking about the philosophy of this world, the, uh, the world system that, uh, that runs this world, and um, the secular humanism, and all these different things that form an ungodly, unbiblical uh, worldview, um, we better be careful. Watch out for the lure of this world system trying to lure us and pull us in so that we agree with all these different things. Um, I wish the whole congregation could have seen the Ken Ham video that was shown in Sunday school because he talked about the tornado and he had all these different things swirling around in this tornado uh, that the world tries to pump at us. And this world system is going to try to get you to fall in love with it. And how we need to avoid that. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the uh, eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the devil, right? And um, so we got to be careful what we allow our affections to get a hold of. We need to be like Paul said in Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things above where Christ is, right? Not on things on this earth. So our affections, very important that we keep uh, a watch over what we're allowing ourselves to fall in love with in this world. Another one that I thought about was we need to watch over our attitudes. And this is really very closely related with the uh, point uh, A, our thoughts. Our attitudes, because really our attitudes come from our thinking, don't they? They're formed out of our minds. And, uh, but uh, the first attitude I think we need to be careful and watch out for is the attitude of pride. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is talking to the Philippians, obviously, about uh, and he's been talking about this in chapter 1 as well, their unity, right? He says uh, in Philippians 2, beginning in verse 1, therefore, if there are any encouragement in Christ, and there certainly is, by the way, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, uh, affection and compassion Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, 
united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, uh, regard one another as more important than yourselves, and do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And then in verse 5, he says, and I, I like the NASB translation, he says, have this not mind, which is King James and some others, but he translates it, they translate it, attitude. I like that. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if you're going to be of one mind and have unity in a church, you'll do it by following Paul, uh, Paul's admonition here of having the attitude that Christ had. Then it explains what that attitude was. Who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and uh, made in human likeness as a man, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what he's saying here is that if they want to accomplish what Paul is getting, wanting them to do here, and that is to be of one mind and uh, have unity in the body, they need to have the same attitude that Christ had, which was an attitude of what? Humility, right? How do you know how great someone's humility is? Well, how great was their step down? Okay, how far do you put yourself under others? How far do you have to go to put yourself beneath others? Did anybody ever in history have to go farther down put themselves below others than Jesus. He was God from eternity past with all the rights and privileges and uh, he deserved to be in heaven forever, never leaving, uh, always worshiped, not spat on. Think about his eternal state in the past and where he came to in this earth, didn't have a place to lay his head. Um, forest of the poor, right? That's humility. Like we can, we can never accomplish that humility, but we certainly can put ourselves down where we belong and understand with that kind of an attitude that Christ had, that there are other people are more important than us, right? And that um, we need to not just look out for ourselves, but look out for others. Jesus, others, yourself. That's the order, isn't it, that we've all been taught from Sunday school. Joy, Jesus, others, yourself. And uh, while that was good for Sunday school, it's still good for us today. And um, so remember, pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, right? I may have that backwards. Anyway, um, you know what pride leads to? We, we need to be on guard at, uh, about this as well. Pride leads to ingratitude. If you think you deserve every good thing in this world that this world has to offer physically, then you're not going to be very thankful. If you, but on the other hand, if you realize that everything that you have is just a gift from God that you really don't deserve, then you're going to be more, have more gratitude toward God, aren't you? But if, if you're not humble, and you think you are great and you deserve this and that and the next thing, then you're going to have a problem with gratitude. And, you know, there's so many other attitudes that we could get into. We just don't have time to get into all of these things today. Uh, but there's a couple of them. That's enough for us to think about, isn't it? Is that enough for you, for you guys to chew on for one, <laughs> one morning? Would be just the idea of having a humble spirit and being full of gratitude toward God for all of his blessings. It's what 
Ingratitude, remember, is what pride leads to. And then there's one more thing under things that we should be watching over, and that, of course, is our actions, our action. But remember that actions can't possibly be right if A, B, and C are not right. Right? <laughs> right. Um, think about it. If our thoughts are not right, can our actions be right? Hmm, I don't think so. If our affections are all wrong, if we're in love with this world, uh, can our actions be right? If our attitudes are all wrong, like we just talked about, can our actions be right? As a matter of fact, I think that we are, in Romans 13, 14, let me read this verse to you. It says, put, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Okay. Now, if our thoughts are all wrong, do you see how that would be making provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts? If our affections are all wrong, do you see how that would make it very difficult for our actions to be right? Do you see how that would be making provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust and our attitudes as well? Yes, we all want to uh, have a, a hope of purity and wanting to progress in our Christian life. But uh, are we willing to watch out for these things that make it so hard? Um, hopefully, we are able to take Paul's admonition to watch out. I think there's also some things that we should watch against and one of those things is ourselves, of course. We've kind of already talked about how we are, but uh, the Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Deceitful. James 1, tells us that he says, but prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who, de who delude themselves. Okay? You can delude yourselves, which is to deceive yourself. So the heart is deceitful. You can deceive your own self. So we need to watch out for ourselves. I think it was D.L. Moody that said, uh, somebody asking what's the greatest, uh, what would be the greatest hindrance, what's the greatest danger to your uh, effective ministry. He was an evangelist that preached all over the world. And uh, he said, well, that would be the man that wears my own hat. <laughs> we know what he meant by that, that the greatest danger to anyone's ministry is themselves. Just look at the multiplied many who have gone down in flames from the ministry over the years through one problem or another, usually sexual. But, uh, yes. See, the flesh, first of all, did you realize that your flesh that you're living in is not saved? Your spirit is saved, right? Soul saved. But, this flesh is not saved. This is the same old rotten flesh we were in before we were born again, right? Until we get rid of this flesh, maybe today, at the rapture, right? As soon as we're transformed in the twinkling of an eye, we are finished with this flesh. Finished. Aren't you glad you don't have to take this? To heaven with you? I mean, my goodness, what a disappointing heaven that would be if we're all up there in our flesh 
and still uh, given to the same things we're given to, thoughts and actions and attitudes like we are now. But um, thank God that that flesh is going to be gone. But while we're here, the, we have the flesh, and sin is always going to have an inroad into our lives. Okay? It has an inroad, and that inroad is our flesh. And there is a residue of the old nature. It rears its head all the time. Uh, some people call that a beachhead. That sin has a beachhead in our lives. And what happened in World War II, like on Iwo Jima? They would come, the Marines would come in, they would land on a focused area, and they would establish a beachhead. Once they established that, they would bring more men in, more equipment in, then they would permeate the whole island until they stamped out every bit of resistance, right? Or until the enemy totally surrendered, okay? And uh, isn't that exactly what sin tries to do with us? That's what Satan, our great enemy, wants to do with us, is that he has a beachhead. Now, whether we let him establish and permeate into the whole life, that's a different story, right? But sin does have a beachhead in our lives. And um, so we have to be so careful and watch against our own selves and our flesh. And we better watch against, while we're at it, we better watch against Satan, our great enemy. That, that one is so obvious, isn't it? But in 1 Peter 5.8, he says, be on the alert because your enemy, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And by the way, what does he want? What's that a picture of? Seeking whom he may devour? I'd say when a, a, a lion gets a hold of one of those little gazelles, he, <laughs> he pretty much destroys that gazelle, right? He shakes the life out of it and eats it, and there is no more. That's what he wants to do to our Christian life. Now, he may not be able to shake the eternal life out of us, but he'd like to do everything short of that. He'd like to render us totally ineffective and uh, unable to serve God if he could do it. He hates God. The best way he can hurt God, hurt his children. That would be true with every one of you, too. If somebody wanted to hurt you, just get a hold of your kids. Ooh, that would hurt. And that's what Satan wants to do to us. He wants to ruin our lives, uh, ruin our Christian testimony, and how we need to watch against him. The uh, One last thing I thought about was we should watch against ungodly men, lest they seduce you. And uh, in, uh, in Proverbs 1.10, it says, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Do not consent. That's an easy way of telling them to go get lost, isn't it? Just get out of here. And uh, yeah, so they can, they sinners, sinful men, women can entice you into sin. And we need to be on the watch for that. Uh, also, they can entice you into error. If you think about it, in um, Acts chapter 20, it said, Paul said to the um, Ephesians as he was departing there, he said, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So ungodly men can squirm their way into positions of authority in a church. That's why you should be taking everything I say right now and say, is that biblical? Is, is what he's saying true? Is he sticking true to the word? Or is he spouting out his own theories about this and that and the next thing? 
I may be guilty of doing that at some point, but you're the ones that will have to hold me right to the fire, right? That's why being a Berean is a good thing, right? Because you hold the speaker to the fire. The Bereans held Paul's feet to the fire. They went and checked that out. And we need to do that as well. Don't let anybody entice you into error. So be on guard. But I also thought that there's on the, I mean, those things are all pretty much bad things you need to watch out for, right? But there are some good things that we need to watch for on the positive side, okay? Some po- I, because I think all those things we've talked about so far, that's enough. that was enough for me to chew on for the last two or three weeks. I mean, is that enough danger that I've warned you about? <laughs> I think so. But let's think about on the positive side some things that we ought to watch out for. For instance, um, we ought to be watching out for opportunities to do good. Opportunities to do good. And I want to go back to uh, Galatians again. Chapter 6 and verse 9, it said, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so this is something we need to be watching for is opportunities for doing good. You know, doing good is one of the Christian sacrifices from back in Hebrews um, chapter 13. Let me read these verses. Through him then, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Those are sacrifices, Christian sacrifices to God. Sacrifice of praise, giving thanks to his name. Doing good is a sacrifice to God. And as well as sharing with the needy is a sacrifice. With those kind of sacrifices, God is pleased, he says. And so let's not grow weary in well-doing, as Paul warned the Galatians against. And you, can, if you've been serving the Lord very long, you could probably sympathize with those Galatians that Paul was talking to. It's easy to get discouraged, very easy to get discouraged. And he's telling us, watch out for that. Don't get discouraged. Just keep it up. Keep looking for opportunities to do good. Then the next thing I thought about under things on the positive side that we should be watching for, we should be watching for the souls of others, the souls of of others. Uh, again, Paul is, is such an example that sometimes puts me to shame. Uh, Paul said, my continual desire and prayer to God is for Israel's that they might be saved. He even said a chapter earlier, that was chapter 10. In chapter 9, he said, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and increasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse. That means I, could, I would go to hell. And uh, I myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That is radical. <laughs> is it not? To love the lost so much you'd be willing to take their place? if that were possible, which it is not. That puts me right to shame. 
but we need to be watching for the souls of others. This is one of those things of kind of like putting others before yourself again, you know? So Paul was an amazing example in that. If I could just get a fraction of that, I would be very thankful. But uh, the last thing I wanted us to think on the positive side of things we should look out for is the coming of Christ. The coming of Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so we need to be watching out for, and when I say watching out for, I kind of mean being prepared for. We don't want to get caught unawares, do we? When Jesus was, if he's to return soon here, we don't want to get caught unawares. Uh, we want to be doing what we should be doing. We want to be found faithful when he comes. And so let's watch out for his coming. Let's keep in mind that Jesus is coming. And then finally, I want us to think about the thought of why should we watch? Well, it's pretty obvious from what I've said so far, but let me just recap it by saying uh, we should watch because uh, many enemies watch against us. Many enemies watch against us. Not the least of which we've already talked about in 1 Peter 5.8. The devil never ceases to watch for opportunities. It never ceases to look for opportunities against us, right? And so that's all the more reason why we should be watching. Because the devil roams about seeking, actively seeking opportunities to ruin us. We should also watch because of the weakness of the flesh. Remember when Jesus came back from praying and found his disciples sleeping in Matthew 26? Uh, in verses 40 and 41, where he said, And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why should we watch? Because the flesh is weak. Um we should not allow, we really have to watch out for a spirit of apathy, an apathy-induced stupor, just the opposite of being vigilant, being on the alert. We should watch because of the weakness of the flesh. We should watch because we have a comparatively short time to watch, if you think about it. Jesus said, could you not even watch with me one hour? Well, this speaks to me of the brevity of life. The life is short. I think back, now that I can remember, about 63 or 4 years into the past. Yeah, I know. I started remembering real early, right? But anyway, I can remember when I was in kindergarten. That seems like, you know, maybe not yesterday, but the day before. I mean... Has time gone faster? What? What happened to the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s? Yeah. Wow. But really, comparatively, compared to eternity, how long do we have to watch? Not really that long, no. And again, let me emphasize that we need to watch because the Lord's return is imminent. The Lord's return is imminent. Nothing has to happen before the Lord can return in the rapture. Nothing. People say, well, this hasn't happened over there yet, and this hasn't happened. When those things happen, then I'll start looking for the rapture. 
are wrong again. That is so wrong. Uh, things can happen very quickly. Uh, and those things that, you, that people think haven't happened, well, they can happen very quickly. There is nothing that has to happen before the Lord returns. He could come this second or this second or, or this one. You get the point. <laughs> anyway, so I want one more, uh, one more point, and that is that if you're here today, and you have never placed your faith and trust in the person of, and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You've never put your faith and trust in him and what he did for you as the salvation for your, eternal salvation for your soul. Then I want to encourage you to not leave this building without making sure about that. You can know for absolute sure if you died today, that you would be in heaven with God for eternity. You can make sure of that with a decision today. Don't leave this building. You see Pastor Bill, you see me, see somebody, see the men in this church, and we will be more than happy to sit down with you and show you from the Word of God how you can know for sure beyond doubt, really, that you have eternal life. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your blessings to us this morning, allowing us to have this church still standing and that we can continue to use it for your glory uh, for many more years or as long as you tarry. And thank you, Father, for um, the admonitions of your word, Lord, to, um, to watch out. May we take heed to your warnings, and may we be vigilant. May we be on the alert, on guard against the things that, that uh, we need to be. And, Father, we just uh, commit ourselves to you and ask for your blessing in our lives. Grow us in our purity and in our sanctification. Help us to progress in our holiness as we go through this life day by day. In Jesus' name, I pray.